San Francisco Mayor London Breed was just caught violating her own mask mandate while she was dancing at one of the city's jazz clubs. Now, the, the incident was caught on tape, so Mayor Breed cannot deny that she was disobeying the mask mandate. Instead, she's making excuses. She's justifying it. You see, what you don't understand is it's totally fine for Mayor Breed to ditch her mask while all you peasants have to wear your masks because Mayor Breed was feeling the spirit. My drink was sitting at the table. I got up and started dancing because I was feeling the spirit and I wasn't thinking about a mask. I was thinking about having a good time and in the process I was following the health orders. Go out and enjoy yourself. Make sure you are vaccinated because of the requirements. But don't feel as though you have to be micromanaged about mask wearing. Like, we don't need the fun police to come in and try and micromanage and tell us what we should or shouldn't be doing. We know what we need to do to protect themse- ourselves. And let me tell you, when the spirit moves you because you are watching history in the making, Bay Area royalty perform, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to turn around and look for where my mask is. Mayor Breed, I totally agree. We do not need the fun police. Now, you are the fun police. I mean, you you are the chief law enforcement agent. You are the executive of San Francisco. So you're making all these other people wear it. But, But now look, if you're telling me that right now that law is off the books, that mask mandate is no more, if you are feeling the spirit, well, that's fine by me because as a fellow spirit feeler myself, I completely agree. Let's all ditch the stupid masks. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. You know, when I want to make sure that my health is totally fine, I don't just look to these expert, mandate, power-happy politicians I check out Bioptimizers. If you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, one of the best things you can possibly do is to start getting enough magnesium. Now, before you run out the door, hold on, hold on a second. You might be inclined to go run out the door, go find the first magnesium supplement that you can. Do not do that. Uh, Most of them that you'll find in the store are made with just the two cheapest, most synthetic forms of magnesium. They are not full spectrum. They will not fix your magnesium deficiency or help you sleep better. There are actually seven unique forms of magnesium. You have to get all of them if you want to experience its calming, sleep-enhancing effects, which is why I would recommend Magnesium Breakthrough by Bioptimizers. You just take two capsules before you go to bed. You will be amazed at how much better you sleep and how much more rested you feel when you wake up. For an exclusive offer right now, Head on over to magbreakthrough.com slash Knowles. Use code Knowles10 to save 10% when you try Magnesium Breakthrough. One more thing, for a limited time, Buy Optimizers is also giving away free bottles of their best-selling products, P3OM and Masszymes with select purchases. Go to magbreakthrough.com slash Knowles right now to get your exclusive 10% discount, plus the chance to get more than $50 worth of supplements for free. If you're feeling the spirit... Lose that mask. Could not possibly agree more. It it turns out it's more than just Mayor Breed who has been feeling the spirit. The showbiz royalty of Los Angeles, the people who were attending the Emmy Awards, also appeared to have been feeling the spirit the other night because while that county has a very strict mandate back in place, it's a mandate that I actually fled last year and somehow it's now back in place in L.A., uh, the, the showbiz people didn't wear their masks. So at, at the Emmys, you didn't see any masks anywhere to be found. You, you know, usually at these kind of glitzy events, you'll be able to peek that in the background, the staff, the help, the filth are, are wearing their masks. Well, the wonderful, beautiful aristocrats, they don't need to wear their masks. But here, you, you just didn't really see a mask in sight. Well, why is that? Uh, the Emmys have come out and made clear that exceptions, quote, exceptions are made for film, television, and music productions since, quote, additional safety modifications are made for such events. And so it's, it's totally fine for the showbiz stars not to wear the masks. You have to. They don't. 
You have to. Are you getting it yet? Are you, are you seeing what's happening? As I have said from the beginning, the mask mandates are not about the science, and they're not really even about public health. They are about the capricious wielding of power that grants certain privileges to some people and takes away those privileges from other people. I love uh, Mayor Breed's attitude in San Francisco. Oh, come on. We all know the masks are BS. Come on. We all know this is ridiculous. You're having a good time. Just go out and have a good time. You know what you need to do to protect your health. So just do it. Exercise your prudence and don't worry about the masks. That, that'd be all well and good if she and all of her other politician buddies were not forcing people to wear them. Someone tweeted this out yesterday. I forget who it was. Would you know what an oligarchy looked like if you saw one? Would you know? I mean, we, we are told that we live in a democracy. We live in a republic. We live in this constitutional order. Would you know if that had morphed into an oligarchy? There is an ancient concept, anacyclosis, the cycle of regimes, how regimes can descend in from a democracy into an oligarchy, say into a monarchy, maybe back into... Would you be able to tell when things had shifted? Because one of the telltale signs, I think, is that there would be one set of rules, a nice, free, advantageous set of rules for a small ruling elite, and there would be a completely different set of rules for the rest of us. That, I think, is what we are seeing. What about the illegal aliens pouring over our border? You know, we have a very porous border to the South under Joe Biden. It's reached record levels of foreign nationals pouring into this country. What's the rule for them? Democrat elite, no masks, so long as you're feeling the spirit. Rest of the country, especially us deplorable, irredeemable, MAGA, supremacist, right, whatever people, you have to wear the mask. What about the foreign nationals who are pouring into our country at the permission and re really encouragement of the Biden administration. Well, turns out, I guess they're feeling the spirit too, because the people crossing into our country are not wearing masks. There's no evidence that they're vaccinated at all. So I can't go into a bar in New York unless I show proof of s that I've had 7,000 booster shots and have 10 masks on. But a Guatemalan national can trot, trot across the border, no big deal. Jen Psaki was asked about this, and the White House's official position is that you don't need to worry about their masks and you don't need to worry about their vaccines because, you know, they're probably not going to stay. Is somebody asking the foreign nationals who are walking into Del Rio, Texas, and setting up camps on this side of the border for proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test? Let me explain to you again, Peter, how our process works. As individuals, as individuals come across the border, uh, and uh, they are uh, both assessed for whether they have uh, any symptoms. If they have symptoms, they are the intention is for them to be quarantined. That is our process. They're not intending to stay here for a lengthy period of time. I don't think it's but the same here. thing. The it's difference? not the same thing. These are individuals, as we've noted and as we've been discussed, we are expelling individuals based on Title 42 specifically because of COVID, because we want to prevent a scenario where large numbers of people are gathering, posing a threat to the community and also to the migrants themselves. So those are the policies that we put in place um, in large part because, again, the CDC continues to recommend Title 42 be in place given we're facing a global pandemic. They're not intending to stay here for a long period of time? Does Jen Psaki think that the illegal aliens are just taking a nice vacation in the United States? They're, they're just taking a little weekend jaunt. Yes, you know, Juan got Monday off too, so we're going to be up for in, in Texas for three days, and then we're going to trot right back across the Rio Grande and go back to Mexico. Is that what's going to happen? Or are they going to stay here forever and ever and ever and generation unto generation unto generation? I suspect it would be the latter. So right there is an obvious lie. Illegal aliens are not just coming for a day or two. They're, they're coming permanently. That's, that's the point. That's why you make the track. Further then, she says, look, Peter, you're being unfair. We are, well, she doesn't say we're quarantining people with symptoms. She goes, the intention is to quarantine people with symptoms. So they're, they're probably almost certainly not even doing that. But okay, at least the intention is there to quarantine people with symptoms. But hold on. I was told that COVID spreads because of asymptomatic people. 
Furthermore, I was told that COVID spreads because of asymptomatic vaccinated people. That's why I need to wear the mask. The mask, which I was told is, exists to protect other people from my germs. I was told that after I was told that the masks don't work at all by Dr. Fauci. But then I was told that the masks exist not really to protect you, but to protect other people from your germs, even if you're asymptomatic, even if you're vaccinated. Why do people need to wear the vaccines on airplanes? Why do people need to wear the vaccines in their workplace? Why do people who are vaccinated, who show proof of their vaccination, have to wear the masks? Why? Because (laughs) it's not about the rule. It's not about the principle. It's not about the virus or the microbes are stopping the spread. It's about the people upon whom the rule is imposed. It's, it's not about the little virus. It's about the movie star, the TV stars at the Emmys. And it's about the illegal aliens that the Biden administration wants to flood into the country because they believe it will give Democrats a permanent electoral advantage. And it's about you. And the first two groups, they can use their prudence. We can prioritize their hopes and dreams. They want to come into America. They want to win their gold statues. They want to feel the spirit and dance before Bay Area royalty. Man, that was some good jazz. You expect me to wear a mask when I got that good jazz going on? Then they're going to lie to you like the mayor of San Francisco did and say, look, I was, I had my drink down. I was dancing without a mask. I was following health procedures. You manifestly were not following health procedures, even according to your own logic. And then they're going to tell you to do whatever they say. Would you know an oligarchy if you saw one? Would you know good American meat if you saw it? I bet you would not. That's why you got to go check out our friends over at Good Ranchers. Did you know that 80% of the grass-fed beef sold in the United States is actually imported from overseas? Sometimes they'll say it's from a local farm. It's from a local farm in South America somewhere. It's not from one here, which is why you got to check out the Good Ranchers. The Good Ranchers are helping out the American rancher. They're helping out the American consumer, and they are giving you top quality beef for unbelievable prices. So whatever you want, they have they have actually more than beef. They've got better than organic chicken, but me, I'm a little more of a beef guy. They got the T-bones, they got the fillets, they got the strips. They have, to my mind, basically the best burgers out there. They're gourmet, delicious burgers that are juicy that I've had within the past few weeks. Uh, Go check them out right now. You get steakhouse quality at a price every family can afford. Right now, if you go to goodranchers.com slash Knowles, you can save 20 bucks. Or better yet, you can subscribe and save on each box of mouth-watering American meats that will show up right on schedule to your door. So right now, 20 bucks off, free express shipping. If you go to goodranchers.com slash Knowles or use code Knowles at checkout, 20 bucks off and free express shipping at goodranchers.com slash Knowles. You are hearing about a lot of different stories in the news. There's a story about a, a young woman who is a travel blogger who went missing and now I think has turned up dead. And then the boyfriend sort of went missing too. And it's one of the, you know, it's a very sad story, but it's a, it's just kind of a, a personal interest story. It's not a, I don't think it means anything for our broader politics. And the media are totally focusing on this story. This is, this is where you've got to put your attention. Meanwhile, we have an historic flood of foreign nationals across our southern border. You're not supposed to look at that. Ignore that. Focus on a YouTuber and this you know, very sad kind of personal romantic crime story. But don't look at the bigger political issue, which is that we've already taken, I think, over 1.2 million illegal aliens into this country this year, and we're going to take way more than that. Okay, we're, it's, it's only heating up right now. And we are, we are being told that the, the criminals in this situation are the Americans, are the handful of Americans who are in any way attempting to enforce the law. There was a, a blue check lib on Twitter, Sawyer Hackett, He is the executive director of Julian Castro's People First Future. Julian Castro, you will recall, ran for president on the uh, unexpected platform of allowing men to have abortions. You might remember he said, we need abortion. We need reproductive justice for trans women. Say, well, trans woman is a Trans woman doesn't have a uterus. I don't think you, okay, I guess I'm for abortions for trans women too. They can have as many abortions as they want. 
Uh, so Julian Castro did not make it very long in the race. Now I guess this guy, Sawyer Hackett, is running his new organization. Sawyer Hackett sees a picture of just a handful of, of uh, Border Patrol on horseback who are trying in any way to stop the flow of illegal immigrants. And he, he tweets this, quote, Border Patrol is mounted on horseback rounding up Haitian refugees with whips. This is unfathomable cruelty toward people fleeing disaster and political ruin. This administration must stop this. So I saw that tweet and I said, you know, I, I'm not saying I'm a zillionaire, okay? I'm not saying I'm a man of extraordinary means, but I would bet every penny to my name that the Border Patrol is not whipping Haitian migrants. I would, I would bet that. And then I looked and I saw, no, you're right. They're not whipping Haitian migrants. They're holding the reins of their horses. But the left is so culturally illiterate that they don't, they don't know that. They're not culturally illiterate. I bet they know a lot more about the Emmys than I do. I bet they know a lot more about those Oscar-nominated movies that three people saw than I do. But they don't know the basic elements of horseback riding. They do this with guns all the time. They'll say, he, he had a semi-fully automatic assault rifle with a, with a 70 ammo clip and it was a super duper assault. And you think, you don't know anything about weapons or what automatic means or semi-automatic. And, and these are the people who are attempting to regulate your weapons. The same thing here. Not only do you not know anything about immigration enforcement, not only do you not know anything about law enforcement generally, you don't even know about horses. You don't even, <laughs> you don't even know the thing that they're riding on. So they're not. A border patrol, I mean, they're doing what they can, but their, their hands are tied, not by whips or reins, but by the, the political chains of the Biden administration. And so they've just got to let these, these immigrants come over. A huge number of them are Haitian, which is kind of weird because Haiti is a little island, right? Haiti is not Haiti is not part of Mexico. So how'd they get over here? I don't know. But they make it to Mexico and they're crossing over into the United States. And we, we have to think, well, you know, you, no, you have to, you go to Haiti or you go to some other country, but you can't, you, not everyone in the entire world can come into the United States. That won't be good for anybody. It won't be good for America. It won't be good for our, our rule of law. And it won't be good for the people because if everyone floods here, then our country does, isn't a country anymore. The place they're fleeing to will cease to exist if we just completely open up our borders. Ilhan Omar has a different point of view. Ilhan Omar, radical left-wing congressman, she came out and said, not only should we allow the Haitian migrants to come in, we owe it to them. I've also heard people say, Haitians, might, many of the Haitians who are at our border might not have actual grounds to seek asylum. These are people who have experienced a natural disaster, um, which allows for people who experience that to seek asylum. They've also experienced uh, political violence, um, political unheaval. They have experienced a crisis after crisis. Uh, we have also contributed to that. Generations um, of Haitians have experienced American policy that has contributed to their starvation, to the criminalization that they are dealing with, and to the inhumane policies that continue um, to destroy the lives of Haitians. So not only do we owe Haitians the, uh, the, the right thing of allowing them um, to, to seek asylum here, but we also owe them uh, the, the kind of policies that would allow for them to dictate the ways in which they want to run their country. C can anyone listening out there translate that into English for me? Because I have no idea what Ilhan Omar just said. People used to get on Trump. They used to attack Trump because Trump would speak in vague terms because maybe he, he wasn't totally caught up on all the details of everything. So say, look, we're going to do something that is really, really positive, okay? And we are, we don't want to do anything that is bad for a We're going to do only good things, okay? And you say, okay, well, you're speaking these really broad terms. Ilhan Omar is speaking in precisely the, the same degree of vagueness. She goes, Haitians have experienced political violence, political upheaval, crisis after crisis. That's true. Haiti is basically a cursed country that has had problems from the very beginning. That's certainly true. Uh, largely political problems, largely problems of the Haitians' own making, but also natural disasters and earthquakes and things like that. We have also contributed to that. 
Ilhan Omar says, generations of Haitians have experienced American policy that has contributed to their starvation, to the criminalization that they are dealing with, whatever that means, to the inhumane policies that continue to destroy the lives of Haitians. What, what policies? Okay, so your, your claim, Ilhan Omar, is Ameri- basically it's America's fault. Everything's America's fault. It's all our fault here. So what is it? What did we do? Did we give them a ton of aid after all of their natural disasters? Did we let a lot of them in every single year into our country? Did, what, did we, what did we do that was so bad? Can you specify what, what contributed to their starvation? All the money that we give them and all the food? Or what, what, what about the criminalization? What, I don't even know what that means. The inhumane policies. You mean letting them come into our country illegally? I, I agree. That is inhu- it's inhumane to Americans. It's not inhumane. To, in a way, I guess it is inhumane to the Haitians. Because if you cross that border, you're dealing with a ton of criminals. And you're, you're putting yourself in a very bad situation. Which is why encouraging those kinds of policies is so awful. We owe it to Haitians to do the right thing to let them seek asylum here. And we owe them the kinds of policies it would allow for them to dictate the ways in which they, they want to run their country. What? What do we owe them? I don't think we owe them anything, frankly. I think we owe solidarity to our fellow man, and we ought to be very generous, as we always are, and we ought to love the Lord our God above all things and love our neighbors ourselves. That does not mean destroy your own country. That will not help our neighbor as ourselves. We're not helping ourselves then in any way. We don't have any regard for ourselves. We're actually annihilating the country by getting rid of our borders. So I don't think that will help our neighbors at all. They've experienced crisis after crisis. We've contributed. We've done. It's our fault. Well, then why the hell are they coming here? Oh man, if this, if we're, if truly we are the great Satan, we are the worst country ever. We are responsible for all the problems that they are fleeing. Why would they come here? This place sounds terrible. You know, the most humane thing to do, I think, the most generous thing to do, would be to say, no, not a single Haitian gets in because we don't want to be any more inhumane and cruel to you. But she doesn't believe this. I mean, nobody believes this. This is madness. We, We talked yesterday in the show about how things are not always as they seem. One of the great advantages of the Trump era of politics and now in the post, post Trump era, I guess, Maybe we're in the pre-Trump era again, depending on what happens in 2024. But one of the great advantages of it is we're seeing the difference between how things appear and how things really are. Would you know an oligarchy if you saw one? How, how our government appears is that it's our democracy and, you know, our, the, t- the people's house. And uh, that's why the attack of January 6th was the worst event in American history. But the reality is, I don't know that the people have a whole lot of say in their government. I don't know that uh, the system of government that we were taught in civics class and Schoolhouse Rock and I'm a bill on Capitol Hill, I'm not sure that's the way we're really run. And furthermore, we're told that the vaccines are the big issue and the people who are not wearing the masks, not taking the vaccine, not going along with the health measures, we're told it's all these white male, terrible Christian Republican Trump supporters. Well, it's not. I don't think it is. I think it's the mayor of San Francisco. And I think there's another story out of New York of three black women who were so angry at the mandates that they actually attacked the hostess at a popular restaurant. You know, it's very, very important, very, very important when we think about how we're going to run our country, how we're going to protect our rights, to protect the right to life, which is why you got to check out 40 Days for Life. It's been a tough news cycle the past few weeks, months, almost years. And so when you get some good news, you should take it, namely this pro-life law in Texas. This is the best news for the pro-life movement. Maybe since Roe versus Wade. You're going to see this come up a lot in conversation, at parties, with your family. You're going to want to know all of the arguments because the left is losing their minds over this and they are demagoguing this issue and they're trying to fight it tooth and nail. What I would recommend is checking out a new book. It's a new book from 40 Days for Life. It's called What to Say When, The Complete New Guide to Discussing Abortion. It's a really easy read for individuals who are looking to defend life and convert hearts, okay? A lot has changed since Roe v. Wade in 1973. What to Say When equips readers with the proven approaches to dismantling the pro-abortion agenda, okay? uh, 40 Days for Life members have already been able to convert the hearts of 221 abortion workers, How incredible is that? So learn what to say, what not to say, 
The book is called What to Say When, The Complete New Guide to Discussing Abortion, How to Change Minds and Convert Hearts in a Brave New World. Get free shipping and 21% off a signed hardback at 40daysforlife.com slash what to say when. Also, head on over to dailywire.com right now. Speaking of these vaccine mandates, you know, Joe Biden, through the administrative agencies, through all these extra constitutional provisions, is going to try to force all of you to take the Fauci ouchie by forcing your employers to force you to do it, right? We're not going to comply with that. We're just, we're just not. Sorry. See you, buddy. So we, we may have to go to court. We'll find out how it goes. If you want to help us out in that fight, if you want to stand with us while we stand with you, head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code do not comply at checkout. You will get 25% off. Enough is enough. Please stand with us. Please stand with the Daily Wire. More importantly, stand with all of the Americans that we, we do not think should have to go along with Joe Biden's preposterous extra constitutional edict. We'll be right back with a lot more. Three people just attacked a hostess at a very famous Italian restaurant in New York on the Upper West Side because the hostess asked to see their vaccine cards, asked for proof of vaccination. I don't think the restaurant wanted to do this. I've been to this restaurant on a number of occasions, and I think they're a good, good old restaurant, Carmine's, but the city is forcing them to. And so the hostess was complying with the stupid city ordinance, and these three people beat up the hostess. Now, If you watch CNN, if you read the New York Times, you know, who were these three people? They were three white, male, Republican, probably Christian, Trump supporters, anti-vaxxer murderers who wouldn't show the vaccine proof so they don't get their bowl of spaghetti, right? So what are their names? Uh, Keita... Nikinge Rankin, 44 years old, Tiani Kishe Rankin, 21, and Sally Rochelle Lewis, 49. Uh, they were arrested and charged with assault and criminal mischief. They don't. So those names, gosh, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to stereotype or they, they don't, they sound a little more ethnically ambiguous than we were told about the, unva- the, the white male Trump supporters, right? Uh, they don't say, sound male, that's for sure. Uh, no, it turns out there are three tourists, three black women who were visiting New York. They show up to the restaurant. They don't want to go along with the mandate. I think these women are from Texas where you don't need to show proof of your fauci ouchy. So they must have been very surprised. Now a lawyer for the women. This is where the story gets complicated. Now a story, uh, a lawyer for the women is saying that the hostess used a racial slur. I don't believe that. I've been to Carmine's. I just don't think that's true. There's so many hoaxes that go on. I write about a lot of those hoaxes, race hoaxes in uh, my book, Speechless, which you can get. The, the worst thing you can be called in America is, is a racist. The worst offense you can possibly commit is to utter the N-word. And so the, the lawyer was saying that. I don't think there's any evidence that the restaurant is vigorously denying that. Now, BLM is showing up and saying they're going to protest not just Carmine's for the hostess's alleged behavior that I am fairly certain did not take place, uh, but they're also going to protest the city's vaccine mandate, which they say is, is a way to keep black people out of places because contrary to CNN reports, black people disproportionately are not getting the vaccine. And so they want to blame everything on white males because white males are the, the worst creatures in the history of the world. And everything they do is terrible. But they, because they're trying to blame this, they're, they're trying to discourage this behavior. They, they don't want to acknowledge that a lot of black people are engaging in the same kind of behavior, namely not wanting to get the Fauci out you right away. So this is a very politically. This might be the most complex political story of all time. Because the first part of the story, three women refuse to go along with a vaccine mandate. Love that. Love that. Refuse to show their papers at the restaurant. Love that. Man, that's great. Kudos to them. Next part of the story, they beat up the hostess. Well, that's bad. We don't like that. Don't beat up the hostess, okay? Especially at Carmine's because it's a nice restaurant. Hate that. Next part of the story, they're accusing this hostess now of using a racial slur. Almost certainly didn't happen. Really hate that. That's ugly ugly racial politics. 
Fourth part of the story, BLM shows up. Now I really hate that because they're going to go loot all the all the spaghetti, you know, just like the, the BLM arsonists and terrorists looted city after city and burned down police buildings and, and courthouses. Really hate that. But then the final part of the story, BLM is opposing the mask mandate citywide. I like that. Am I on the side of BLM now? I guess in this regard, I sort of am. Politics makes for strange bedfellows. This to me is the most interesting part of this whole story. It's the, it's the only reason why this is news, as far as I'm concerned. It's not because of the typical racial politics that you always hear about. It's not That to me is the least interesting part of the story. What's interesting here is not the race aspect, it's the COVID aspect. This COVID, COVIDistan, this new COVIDistan country that we're all living in, is realigning a lot of politics, at least temporarily, and maybe it'll have a more of a permanent effect. The people who are opposed to the COVID public health dictatorship are not just white male Trump supporters. They're black, black, young black women. We, well, we were told that's not possible. The people who are opposed to the mask mandates are some radical leftists, actually, too. The people who do not like the way that our government is being run, it's not, it doesn't break down just on party lines or even ideological lines. It's a little bit more us versus them. It's a little bit more the people versus the ruling class. It's a little bit more the people who thought we were living in a constitutional republic versus increasingly the oligarchy. Would you know an oligarchy if you saw one? And so everyone, when they're talking about this Carmine story, and it's, it is going to crop up on TV, you're only going to hear people talking about the racial aspect. Don't take the bait. Don't fall for that. The interesting aspect is what impelled these women to lose their temper and, you know, start, you know, punching people in the first place. And what then impelled the racial politics, because that's the only way you can talk about it, because you're not allowed to talk about the, the public health dictatorship. Here's the proof of this. Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, is in hot water again. Oh boy, is he in trouble. Oh, Justin Trudeau. What's he in trouble for? Is he in trouble for a major corruption scandal involving a, a construction company called Lavalin that took place just three years ago? That, that where Justin Trudeau was actually formally charged with an ethics complaint. This is the, the, from Canada's top ethics watchdog. This is the first prime minister in Canada's history to have this happen to him. Just on paper, the most corrupt prime minister ever in the history of Canada. No, 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 it's not that. Is it because he's persecuting Christians and shutting down their churches? No, it's not that. Is it because he's like Canadian politicians for a very long time, permitting abortion up until the moment of birth? has some of the most barbaric abortion laws in the entire world. Just pure infanticide. No, it's not that. It's because he, um, oh, he wore blackface once, which we already knew about. That's why he's, that's the scandal. Justin Trudeau, who we know wore blackface, now we have another photo of him wearing blackface from, I think, the same event. That's the big scandal. I do, oh man, I know, I know this is going to be, this is going to get me in trouble with all the left-wing groups out there. I don't, I don't care that Justin Trudeau wore blackface. I don't, I, I don't care at all. I don't care that Jimmy Fallon wore blackface. Neither does the left, by the way. I don't care that Ted Danson wore blackface. Neither does the left, by the way. I don't care that Joy Behar wore blackface. Neither does the left, by the way. I don't care that Megyn Kelly talked about blackface once and the left really cares. That's a big problem. That's a really, that's, you've got to lose your career for that. I don't care. No one actually cares. No, nobody cares about blackface itself. People are using that as a way to feign indignation because race is the only way that we can talk about sin and grace and justice and crime anymore in the entire Western world. But no one cares about the blackface itself. This is a real indictment of our culture, that blackface is what people are attacking Justin Trudeau for. On the, on the long list of Justin Trudeau's sins, blackface is somewhere around number 5,326. Okay, it's not even close to the top. But I've said this before, I may have said it before on this show. The worst thing you can be called is a racist 
The only, the only way we can talk about transgressions of the moral order is in terms of race. And the reason for that is we've adopted in many ways a materialist view of the world. So our view of the world only runs skin deep now. We deny that God exists. We deny that a moral order exists. We deny that there's anything beyond the flesh in the present. And yet we still intuit that some things are right and some things are wrong. So the only way that we can discuss them is using the language of skin, is using the language of physicality. This is why you heard around 9-11, you heard people warning against anti-Muslim racism. As we pointed out then, Islam is not a race. <laughs> Islam is a religion. So if you don't like Muslims or you object to Islam, you are not doing so on the basis of racism. You're doing so on the basis of your religious views. You're doing so on the basis of your philosophical views or your sociological views, but not racism. But that's the only way that we can talk because we're stupid, because we've gotten extremely stupid in this culture <laughs> and we do not possess the philosophical or political sophistication to debate these things. Is it any wonder that increasingly we are living in an oligarchy. Now, speaking of ethnically ambiguous governors, we have to move away from uh, the melanated uh, Justin Trudeau for a second to talk about Beto O'Rourke. Beto O'Rourke. Sounds like a Mexican, looks like an Irishman. Beto O'Rourke, you'll remember, ran for, what was the first thing? He's run for everything. He ran for Senate against Cruz, a congressman, kind of a backbencher congressman. Then he ran for Senate against Cruz and lost. Then he ran for president and he got the spread, baby. That guy, Vanity Fair, he was the one. Beto's the one we've been waiting for. And he completely flopped. He was just a joke skateboarding punk in a Whataburger parking lot. <laughs> we didn't go anywhere. And uh, so then he, he lost. And then he went on this road trip where he pretended to be like a beat poet. And he wrote, I'm just trying to just trying to find myself on the road. Well, now he's back, not with a real job, but he's back running for governor again, according to Axios. Beto O'Rourke is preparing to run for governor of Texas in 2022 with an announcement expected later this year. Texas political operatives tell Axios. The reason I bring it up is not because Beto O'Rourke is a serious person, but you should not count your chickens before they hatch. Beto O'Rourke is a joke of a person, but he is persistent. And persistence often pays off in politics. Look at Senator John Ossoff. Senator John Ossoff ran for Congress in Georgia. He's a Democratic senator. He ran for Congress in Georgia. Hollywood flooded money in there. The whole Democrat establishment flooded money and he lost. He was a joke. And then what happened? He just ran again later, ran for Senate. He got an upgrade, right? Now he's, now he's a senator. Richard Nixon lost the presidency in 1960. Well, I know we're not allowed to talk about election fraud, but he officially lost the presidency in 1960. I don't know. A lot of dead people voted for Kennedy. Uh, so then he loses in 60. He runs for governor of California in 1962. He loses that also. His career is over. He's done. Then he runs for president in 1968 and he wins. It's one of the greatest political comebacks ever. Do not count Beto out. The reason Beto is running right now is not because he thinks he's gotten more popular or smarter or more talented. The reason Beto is running is because we've changed our election systems. And Beto is counting on the new election systems, widespread mail-in voting, the, the, the reduction of election integrity measures, to push him over the finish line. He's also counting on the flood and flood of illegal aliens who are pouring over, having an effect either immediately or over time to give Democrats an advantage in Texas. Do not count him out. He would not be running if he, if he and the Democrats did not think he had some chance of winning. Speaking of very bad governors, this is a story that's not getting any traction, but it really should. This is one of the worst things that Gavin Newsom has done in California, and it looks like he's going to get away with it. In one of his first actions since surviving his recall election, Governor Newsom abolished single-family zoning in California. Newsom abolished the suburbs is what that means. He greenlit a series of bills that will increase the state's housing production. Signed Senate Bill 9 into law, opens the door for the development of up to four residential units on single family lots in California. The Democrats have been pushing for this for a very long time because the Democrats do very well in the cities. They do not do very well in the country and the suburbs are the battleground. If you can effectively abolish the suburbs, if you can make the suburbs a lot more herb, you, the Democrats will have a major and probably permanent advantage. Now, I, I kind of like the suburbs. 
I kind of, when I was a young man, I wanted to be in the city. Now that I'm an old man, married with a kid, I like the suburbs are a great place where you can have the American dream, where you can have a house, where you can have maybe a little bit of property, where you can have a nice neighborhood where it's not gangs running all over and it's not homeless and, and needles and human feces and it's not like you're living in San Francisco, where you can have a nice place to live for relatively not a ton of money. That was the American dream. Democrats have been trying to abolish that for a long time because they don't like America and they want to give us a nightmare. So th they've, they've been pushing for this. And Gavin Newsom is one of the first things he does, not before the recall election because he knows people are going to hate it, but after the recall election. All right. And Gavin Newsom, he's not going to live in some apartment building. Okay. Gavin Newsom is not going to live in some duplex or quadruplex where, you know, he's, he's living with a bunch of, he's going to get to live in his nice house in his nice fancy neighborhood. And that's going to be fun. Nancy Pelosi is going to get to live in her nice house in her nice fancy neighborhood and with her lovely American suburban lifestyle dream. But you're not, you don't get that because that's wrong. People need housing. How, how do you selfish deplorable? You don't even want to build more housing right on your backyard. It's not going to happen for the ruling class. It's only going to happen for you. Would you know an oligarchy if you saw one? You know, one of the signs that we have lost control of our government is when the people that, that are in charge, many of whom we put in charge, or at least it seems like we put them in charge, you know, we go and we vote and then they make appointments and then the appointments make appointments and okay, so you've got this government. One of the signs that you've lost control of your government is when the ruling class rules by their whims, by their caprices, where it's arbitrary. And uh, nowhere is that clearer than in our new COVID policies, the COVIDistan country that we're living in. Scott Gottlieb, former commissioner of the FDA, just went on Face the Nation. He was asked about this six foot rule. You remember that? So you got to mask up to slow the spread and you got to stand six feet away from people. And then you got to get the vaccine. And even when you get the vaccine, you still got to stand away sometimes and mask sometimes. And it was all very unclear. So Gottlieb was asked, where, where did the six foot rule come from? You know where it came from? I don't know. The six feet was arbitrary in and of itself. Nobody knows where it came from. The initial recommendation that the CDC brought to the White House, and I talk about this, was 10 feet. And a, a political appointee in the White House said, we can't recommend 10 feet. Nobody can measure 10 feet. It's inoperable. Society will shut down. So the compromise was around six feet. Now, imagine if that detail had leaked out. Everyone would have said, this is the White House politically interfering with the CDC's judgment. The CDC said 10 feet. It should be 10 feet. But 10 feet was no more right than six feet and ultimately became three feet. But when it became three feet, feet, the, the basis for the CDC's decision to ultimately revise it from six to three feet was a study that they had conducted the prior fall. So they changed it in the spring. So he, go, he goes on. It's worth listening to the whole interview because Gottlieb really gives you a peek behind the curtains. And I always, I always sort of liked Gottlieb. He was, he was the Trump FDA commissioner. And, uh, you know, tr I, I wish Trump had handled COVID better. He was really up against the wall. I don't think there's any Republican who would have handled COVID better, but you do wish there was a guy who just said like, no, we're not doing this. We're just not going to lock down. You don't get 15 days. You don't get anything. We're just going to keep the country open and deal with it. It, it. it was almost certainly impossible politically and otherwise, but at least now they're kind of opening the curtain on this. And so what Gottlieb says is the six foot recommendation no one has any idea where it came from. But then he goes on, he says, the original recommendation was 10 feet. That was from the CDC. So you're going to hear people tell you, well, yeah, six feet was arbitrary, but really it should have been 10. And they just said politically you couldn't do it. Except that the 10 feet was wrong too. It was just, I don't know. Then it became three feet. Three feet, that's okay. And now, okay, the compromise is this and that. What is the compromise? I thought we were talking about science. We're just talking about the incompetent, but ironclad rule of a ruling class. And they're just going to keep it up, by the way. They're just going to, we can, I can talk until I'm blue in the face. Say, look, it was arbitrary. Look, the masks, look, the distance, look, the, the doesn't matter. 
they're going to keep it up. They're not going to abide by the policies themselves, especially if they're feeling the spirit. But they are going to force you to abide by all of these policies. The left is very persistent. You know, there, there are bans in, in certain parts of this country now on critical race theory in schools. That's great. I love that. I think we got to kick it out of schools. There's three views on this. There's the leftist view, which is indoctrinate kids into critical race theory. There's the libertarian view, which is, you know, just do whatever. You can do whatever you want. And uh, it's kind of up to you. And uh, I don't want to impose my views on you. And it's a free marketplace of ideas, right? And then there's the conservative view, which is, no, this stuff is poison. It undermines students' education. Kick it out and fire the teachers who push it. So there's an Iowa teacher who is very frustrated by the CRT ban. And now she's bragging about the ways that she circumvents it. I said, but we also need to take a look at HF802. And I literally put the law in front of them, gave them access to it with a link. And I said, and I need to just let you know, there are now concepts that it is illegal for me to teach you about, according to the state of Iowa. And we went through, um, they used to be called defined concept or divisive concepts. Now they're called defined concepts in our law. Um, so I went through those 10 defined concepts with them um, so that they could see what the law was. And they immediately, by the time I think we were on the second or third one, they're like, but is it illegal for me to ask questions? Can I? And I was like, there, you, this is only for me. You can ask as many questions as you like. And then I took him to the part of the law that said, um, this law doesn't prohibit me from answering questions. I said, so if there's any question that you have about these defined concepts, you can ask them and then I can answer them. <laughs> so I said, so let's just take another minute what questions do you have that you want me to build this course around and take some time to answer? And the questions after going through HF802 were so much more pointed. Like one of them straight up was a sticky note that says, is the United States systemically racist? And I was like, well, that will be a fascinating conversation that now we can have because you've asked. Oh, wow. Isn't she clever? Isn't She's so clever. She's gonna, because the, the law, like the, the people, <laughs> let me just, I'll take you through. She probably hasn't seen Schoolhouse Rock in a while. The people voted for their representatives and the people fund the government, including the public schools, and pay that woman's salary. And then the people said, you know, we don't want you teaching our kids that white people are horrible and racist and irredeemable. We don't, we don't think that's good. We don't think it's true. And we don't think it's good to teach a kid that. And we think you're a psycho and we don't want you doing that. So they pass a law through their constitutional order. And then this teacher says, thank you. Oh, thank you for that salary. That's good. Thank you for your, that paycheck. I'm going to put that over here. And, you know, I love our democracy. Our democracy is so great. And now I'm going to completely disregard the law. And I'm going to continue to teach kids that white people are evil and America's a terrible place. She just admits it there. She goes, is America systemically racist? Well, <laughs> you know, I'm, the law says I'm not allowed to tell you that it is, but yeah, it's an interesting question. <laughs> and since you asked, since I impelled you to ask that question, now I'm going to tell you it's terrible. America's terrible and white people are evil and everything's, and you're the worst. And we all need to become like Haiti. And that's why we need to let the, all the Haitians into America. Is that, am I following that? And you've got to mask up unless you're feeling the spirit if you are a Democrat mayor or a Hollywood celebrity, but not you because you, the people are evil. And I don't care what you tell me to do. And I don't care what laws you pass. I am not beholden to your laws. Would you know an oligarchy if you saw one? I'm Michael Knowles. This is the Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Nika Geneva. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. On The Matt Wall Show, we talk about the things that matter, real issues that affect you, your family, our country, not just politics, but culture, faith, current events, all the fundamentals. If they matter to you, come check out the show.